Um, okay, so um, using this word today, uh, I'm going to talk about um, the aleatory and um, if it's aleatorics, that is linked to the word rhetorics, rhetoric. So that we need to have a think about what these two words mean um, and how they are, how they can work together and how this is useful for um, your writing. So using the tool of um, the Etim online website, always useful for terms, we look at the etymology of these words. So the aleatory, um, an adjective which means of uncertain outcome, depending on a contingent event, literally um, depending on the throw of a die. So this is about chance um, and contingency. So it's about throwing a dice. Um, it's also related to the word axis, which is interesting. Um, and that might spark off um, different uh, connotations for some of you. So we know that the word axis, this imaginary line around which a body rotates like the earth, um, aleatory is, is, is linked to that. Um, so that's, so we're thinking about chance uh, and various ways we can use that in writing. So rhetoric, um, you're probably more, uh, kind of used to as a, as a term, as a word. Um, this is about the art of persuasiveness and eloquence in language. So the way that we use language to influence people. And this is, this is at work always in writing. It's an ancient trope, um, but it's uh, relevant in contemporary writing just as much. Rhetoric is always there. Um, so if we have aleatory rhetorics, that would mean that we're using somehow harnessing um, this chance element, this contingent element um, with a rhetorical way of using language. So to put these things together, there's various ways it can be done. And I think various ways it has been explored uh, in certain parts of literary history. And um, one time I think is really stands out for European literature anyway, and that's the early avant-garde um, surrealism. And even before that, you have uh, in France anyway, uh, Mallarmé, Stéphane Mallarmé and his, uh, this, quite famous poem, which in English, uh, the title is A Throw of the Dice Will Never Abolish Chance. Maybe you've heard of this poem, I, I don't know. Um, but the, this was, this was at, actually at the end of the 19th century, so around about 1897 or so. Um, and the way that this text was published, um, oh yeah, before we get to that, I just want to show you um, another of our useful tools, the uh, Ngram Viewer, Google Ngram Viewer. If you see um, the difference between the ways in which these words have proliferated in texts from 1500 to 2019, you can see that rhetoric um, has this explosion of use, this spike um, in the kind of mid 16th century which is the time in which so there was an explosion of a profusion of so many things. But in terms of um, the use of rhetoric in a kind of renaissance, as in a rebirth of the ancient kind of traditions of writing, which is exactly what's happening at this time. So that's why rhetoric is um, suddenly very much used at this time. And then it's a little more steady coming up again after the um, 2000, whereas aleatory, almost zero in by comparison, almost zero. And then from 
the 19th century starts being used a bit more and then um, really starts to increase at the by the beginning of the 21st century. So you see how these um, have a different trajectory in terms of their usage. So that's worth, um, worth thinking about. Okay, so this poem from uh, Malame, A Throw of Dice Will Never Abolish Chance. So I've just, um, I just wanted to show this to you because it's a nice example, it's a nice early example of experimentation with a spatial arrangement of text in poetry. Um, but, and the spatial arrangement plays with the, this kind of celebration of chance and contingency. So uh, we don't need to spend a long time looking at it, but as you can see there, um, the, there are different um, kinds of typeface. The words are kind of scattered across the page in a way that looks like it's governed by chance, nothing else by chance. Um, and it's very hard when you read that poem to get a sense of a unified meaning. Um, and that's a kind, I think, deliberately so. So a throw of dice will never abolish chance. Even the title is quite enigmatic, I would say. So um, whether it's in French or in English or however, um, here's some more uh, pages. As you can see, um, the, the way in which the words are arranged on the page and the different sizes, um, some are in capital letters, some are not. Um, so there's this kind of multiplicity of meaning. It's not unified. It's fragmented in different ways. Um, so uh, this is obviously now quite an old poem. Uh, I thought it was, would be interesting to see how this has been, how the kind of aleatory chance um, element has been interpreted or used or expressed in recent uh, artworks which, which work with this text. And there's a, a nice example here. So there's an opera. This was maybe 10 years ago or so, an opera performance of the text which harnesses and plays with the aleatory in unexpected ways. So I'll just show you um, a snippet from this performance. So this is um, in, the, in, in America and um, this composer, John King, um, I'll explain after I've shown you a bit.
Okay. So, um, regardless of what you think about that, whether it's your cup of tea or not, um, I think it's really interesting because of the way that this um, performance was done. And this is the chance part. It was done differently every night. So listen to the, um, the little discussion about it on this page. So he says, um, uh, so the, the person, the interviewer says, can you explain in more detail how the configuration of the opera is determined by a computer generated, generated time code? And the composer says, yes, exactly, that's right. Each night, the order changes. The durations of each aria changes within set limits. The orchestral music changes so that sometimes a singer is singing with a full, complex orchestral texture. And the next night, the same aria sung against a solo English horn, for example. The lighting changes, the video, the movements, the live electronics, etc., all change for each iteration of the piece. The changes being determined through chance operations and random number generators. That is, I, him, have nothing to do with it. We do the opera in two acts, each act being a different version of the poem, so that the audience can experience this shift within a single evening's performance. And it will be a premiere every night. So this is chance governing the uh, flow or the direction of every single performance so that every single performance is different and it's different within itself as well because there are two versions within the performance. Um, so I think this is a lovely example of how this notion of chance can be played using the technologies that we have today. So it's no longer so it's no longer uh, groundbreaking to place your text in this random way on the page. Um, this is something which we see a lot now. Still a nice thing to play around with, and I think I have said to you before, you can do this in your writing um, if you want to create a particular effect. Um, but there are other ways to play with the notion of chance. So I just wanted to show that one for you. Okay, so. Um, this chance, this, this um, aspect of chance, I think that we see in the poem from Mallarmé feeds into um, one of the major avant-garde movements, um, which is surrealism. Um, and I think, so, so this is a little bit later, we're in the 1920s now. So this is at the same time as uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland poem, which we're gonna talk about a little later, which is not surrealist, really. It's, it's something else, it's in its own category, I would say, that poem, but it's in the same, the same time and the same, uh, I, let's say, well, the same historical landscape. Um, but surrealism, surrealism is, is the avant-garde movement that harnesses chance um, in a very explicit way. Um, so André Breton, um, who was the main leader of the surrealist group um, and who wrote the surrealist manifesto, um, he would talk a lot about objective chance. And we can we sometimes can think about this as uh, the, the notion of a coincidence or the way something happens by chance and it, it, it's as though it was de uh, designed so it happens by chance but it looks as though it was designed by somebody um, or planned um, and these notions along with other ones within surrealism i think are useful to deploy in writing um, of any kind. So this is why I'm, I'm foregrounding surrealism in general and chance specifically as something you can think of and use in your writing. <clears throat> so automatic writing is something um, which I don't think we've ever explicitly done automatic writing as exercises um, because really we're working more with 
Um, we've worked a lot with text, which is already there and rearranging and reconfiguring. Um, but automatic writing, one of the most quintessential surrealist writing exercises um, is just where you write as though you're writing from your unconscious, you're writing as if you're writing in your sleep. So all of the things which normally would keep us writing in a regular sense-making way are not really considered in automatic writing and you just write and see what comes out. It's a kind of free writing exercise. And this is something which is good sometimes as a, an exercise to do for 10 minutes or so to yourself when you want to um, kind of get your creative uh, juices flowing, let's say. Um, and it then can be useful to get into a flow of writing and then you can write something where you can where you're directing it a little bit more. So um, it's also related to chance because um, you don't know what's going to come out at that moment. It depends upon ver many variables. What you what your recent um, kind of short term memory is processing. There are many cognitive um, reasons uh, and factors that would govern. Um, what comes out um, and it maybe that's chance and it I mean we don't need to uh, spend a long time getting into the philosophical um, or psychological implications of, of, of chance um, kind of against the way that the brain functions and but I think if we just think about it as a as um, another um, if we're if we're creating an instrument with which to make music or writing, um, this is another string to the bow, if that makes sense. Um, the role of chance and how it relates to how we direct our writing. So that's automatic writing. Um, and then if obviously in surrealism, this is very much linked to visual art, they are connected um, and painting. So this one, Miro's, um, the birth of the world, uh, what he said about um, painting. He says, rather than setting out to paint something, I began to paint, and as I paint, the picture begins to assert itself or suggest itself under my brush. The first stage is free, unconscious. So this is an interesting description um, of a painting process which we can use for thinking about writing because the way that he describes the picture begins to assert itself or suggest itself. The agency is located in the, in the, in the picture, in the painting rather than in the painter. And so um, this is also linked to the, this, this aspect of chance because um, when you're writing a text, when this kind of automatic writing, for example, something emerges, um, something emerges, which is not, uh, it doesn't appear to be entirely of your design. There's something else. So um, an, a kind of optional exercise you can do um, when you look at this painting or any painting, a surrealist kind of painting, you write down all the words that spring to mind when looking at that painting, especially in light of the title. Because we're a long way from a realist representation. There's a, this is an abstract uh, painting. And that brings with it, um, ch chance is very much related to ab abstraction in this way because um, the way in which you read that painting um, will be different. Every single one of you will uh, read that painting differently. So there's an openness um, related to this kind of abstract uh, painting. So back to uh, writing. Um, and, um, oh yeah, I wanted to show you, uh, this is related to a childhood game, which I don't know if this is played, I mean, maybe you can tell me. Um, 
I don't know if this is played outside of the UK, but we have this game. Yeah. Um, I am playing it currently with my daughter and we're having so much fun. Ah, this is great. Monsters. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> You're playing it with drawing and with, in this way? Yeah, with drawing and uh, just folding the, the paper. It's, no, it's really fun, really yeah. fun. Um, so we did this, when I was a kid, we did this with um, with writing. So we would write, and we called the game Consequences. And you would write, you would be a group sitting in a circle and you would write somebody's name, fold the paper over, pass it round, write somebody else's name, pass it round, where they met, what this person said, to the other person, what they said in reply, um, and then the consequences of this conversation. And then you unfold and there's a random story emerges. So this is very much governed by chance. Um, so it can be done with drawing, um, it can be done with writing, and um, this is a game. So this, th th this is a game which I think is, um, really can be really fruitful to play if you want some kind of inspiration to to uh, write a story or a poem or something um and this this is an example from these artists uh, jake and dinos chapman which is from 2000 uh, the tate modern and they they called it the exquisite corpse um so you can see how yeah a lot of fun is, is in these games which kind of use chance as a mobilizing force for creative uh, expression, I would say. Okay, so we'll just move on to the wasteland. And okay, so chance is one thing and chance is related to um, this poem, this long poem, which I sent round this week, and I don't know if people have had the chance to look at it, and I hope that um, you weren't put off by its kind of uh, seemingly random, again, random nature of different voices, different scenes, different styles, different moods. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a mix, uh, the wasteland. And it's notoriously challenging to grasp on a first reading. So, I, and I remember first reading The Wasteland as a student and uh, finding it very intimidating and, and, and quite dry and quite dark and depressing and didn't really understand. It was one of the, it's probably one of the most important uh, foundational modernist poems of the early 20th century. Um, as you can see, it was published in 1922. And um, this year, 1922, is a really, really important year for English literature. There were many important texts published in 1922, one of them being The Wasteland, another being James Joyce's Ulysses, um, which I'm a huge fan of, um, and I'm a fan of The Wasteland. And I think the other thing is, I think Virginia Woolf's Mrs. novel, Mrs. Dalloway, I think, I can't quite remember now, but um, we're, in, we're nearly in um, 2022, which is going to be 100 years on. Um, so I think there will be kind of celebrations in the literary world next year about this, because it's um, in the English literature world anyway um a hundred years on from a really really important year in modern uh modernist literature let's say but um anyway so the wasteland um so we can have a little chat later about how you found this poem um but it's something which as with all poetry comes alive when you hear it um so that's t.s Eliot there a picture um, and we do have uh, a recording of the poet himself reading his poem. So I like to play 
a little bit of the poet himself reading his poem to students, but not the whole thing because it's actually, well, you, I'll let you think for yourselves how this sounds, but I think the way that he is speaking is quite alienating for a contemporary audience because his accent is very antiquated and he is not performing it in the way that an actor would and in the way that so we have this actor Fiona Shaw performing it and really making an overt gesture to show the differences between the voices and the styles and this is the main thing the main reason why I wanted to share this poem with you it's about the, the distinction in voices um, and showing that you can do, you can really inhabit multiple voices in one text and this is one of the I think kind of prototypical texts that does that so I will play you a little bit of um of Eliot himself. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, Coming over the Starnbergerse with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russin, stamm aus Litauen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What Yeah, we only have that check. The voice changes then. But this is this is Elliot's first part. Um, so that's uh, as you can hear, he's he, he it's quite kind of it's not exactly monotone but he doesn't change um he doesn't perform it he's reading it um he's paying attention to the sound um but he's not performing it in the way that um so i also sent around this video of fiona shaw uh performing this um and i yeah i always suggest that you to get a feel for the poem it really bears repeated reading repeated listening um, and if you're unsure about what's going on, what, why, why there is this particular quotation, why this changes, there's there's lots of information online about exactly what Eliot is doing in the poem. Um, I'll I'll play you. So Fiona Shaw has read this poem multiple times. Um, I sent round one from from 1995. Um, she has more recently done uh, another performance, so I'm going to show you just how we've just heard Elliot do the first uh, section. Now let's let, let's see Fiona Shaw doing. This is a different uh, a different performance. Um, the first section. Let's go back to the beginning. The Wasteland The Burial of the Dead April is the cruelest month Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, 
stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us coming over the stand magazine with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hof Garten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousin, he took us out in a sleigh and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains there, you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief the dry stone, no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch mit der Wind. Okay, I will stop that there. Um, so that's one uh, flavor of the beginning of the wasteland. And there it, he goes through many different phases, many different kind of scenes, um, which are set in the poem. And so you get a sense in that beginning part that, uh, and also from the title, that the, the overall landscape created in the poem is not one of bountiful abundance. Um, because, and, and I think it is, it is worth thinking about the date of the publication and the sh kind of shock being felt through throughout the world really um in the aftermath of the first world war and i think this is one thing which Eliot is responding to in this poem um and the the, the theme which is running through the poem um throughout the poem until the end i think is this kind of uh when he asks what are the roots that clutch um there's a sense of a lack of roots, a lack of growth, a lack of, um, yeah, a lack of, uh, a lack of growth is one, one way of saying it. And there's a lot of talk of drought and a lack of water. Um, and he himself in the notes at the end of the poem talks about a myth, which he is drawing on very heavily in the poem about a, an ancient um, pagan fertility myth um, of the fertility of the land and um, the, the lack of the fertility of the land. And he's using this in a metaphoric way. So, but, but I mean, that's not the, the, the kind of theme of the poem and the context of the poem is not our focus here. The focus is on the style and the format and how that could be employed nowadays. So are we, the world is extremely different now in many different ways. Um, but if you were going to employ this, this style of multiple voices, multiple scenes, um, multiple quotations, um, multiple formats, all of which we have um, looked at in various ways so far on the course, how could, how would this look? That's my question. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's my, that's what I'm, I'm wondering. This is a model for us 
Um, and I think a waste, a, a kind of wasteland style poem written today would be very different. Um, yeah. So um, the over the period of the the kind of composition uh, of the wasteland, and I say composition because um, that's a word which we normally use to talk about music, um, but I think it is a, a kind of musical text. There are song lyrics in there. Um, when you perform the text, uh, you, as you just heard, you can sing some of the parts uh, and the voices are very different. So when Eliot was writing this poem, he, he had a working title for the poem, which was not The Wasteland. The title was, He Do the Police in Different Voices. And that sounds a bit strange um, and possibly not as kind of grand uh, as The Wasteland. Um, and you might notice that it's not grammatically correct. He do the police in different voices. So this is a little, a little bit of intertextuality here. Um, so a text referencing another text. You have, um, this is a quotation. He do the police in different voices. This is a quotation from uh, Charles Dickens' novel, Our Mutual Friend. So Charles Dickens, another huge name in, in English literature. Um, there is a character in Dickens' novel, Our Mutual Friend, um, who can't read very well. So there's a discussion in that novel about literacy. And um, this character, I've, this is the quotation from the novel from uh, Our Mutual Friend. I'll read it for you. I ain't, you must know, said Betty much of a hand at reading writing hand, though I can read my Bible and most print. And I do love a newspaper. You mightn't think it, but Sloppy is a beautiful reader of a newspaper. He do the police in different voices. So uh, Elliot was obviously very taken with this description. He do the police in different voices. Um, and this kind of scene of someone reading, one character reading out, a newspaper to another character um, who can't read very well and, and performing all the different voices. And this is, I think, really significant um, when you're studying the wasteland as a text um, of multiple voices. And um, in, in, in looking online at how at other ways in which this has been in which kind of in the digital realm, this poem has been uh, analyzed, researched. Um, I came across a nice, um, a nice website, which I would uh, recommend you to look at. Um, and this is done by some students who were analyzing the text and they have created um, a, a version of the text which shows the different voices and um, where it switches from one voice to another. Um, how, when, when the computer, the, the program which they've generated to, to kind of analyze, the computer decides when, a ch when the voice changes compared to when they as a class decided where the voice changes. So you can look through when the computer thinks that the, the voice has gone to another voice, um, it has a deep red. And then if there, if the computer is medium sure, it's a paler red and then not very sure, um, it's very pale pink color. Um, so this is an interest, really interesting um, example of a kind of uh, digital uh, analysis. Um, and it's, you can, you then can look at the different features which are uh, quotations in another language, somebody's name, um, somebody's speech, a, a quotation outside the text, a repetition, an echo, um, an onomatopoeia, which we uh, of different types, you can see there, um, you can see which type of onomatopoeia. Um, if you click on one of these and then go through, it will highlight names, 
it would highlight speech, etc. So this is very helpful for anyone studying this text. So um, I, uh, yeah, I recommend you to have a look at that if you're interested in getting familiar, familiarizing yourself a little bit more with the uh, with the poem. So yeah, he do the police in different voices. And the thing to hold on to is different voices. So let's go back to what we can do ourselves now. Um, so I wanted to show you um, a writer because this is nearly 100 years ago. Um, I wanted to show you uh, a poet from, from now, from contemporary times, who also works um, in an epic way, I would say, um, or with epic figures, um, epic themes, and uses these, um, for example, figures from mythology in a contemporary way. So I mentioned Kay Tempest at the beginning of this course. Um, Kay Tempest is, a, is an amazing uh, poet, performer, musician, started off as a rapper, um, and then became known in the kind of performance poetry scene in London, and now has published novels, collections of poems, plays, um, had a play put on a version of Dante's Par Paradiso at the National Theatre this year. Um, they're really a, an amazing um, force of, of poetic, uh, I don't know, genius maybe. Uh, so I thought Tempest would be a nice example to show you because um, they wrote a poem uh, about the mythological figure of Tiresias. And Tiresias is one of the speakers, one of the voices in Eliot's The Wasteland. So um, in terms of this kind of rhetorics, as in this using language to influence people, and I said this is from ancient times, Tiresias is a mythological figure from ancient times. Tiresias appears in uh, Homer's Odyssey, which is what is a kind of stock origin of, of uh, one of the kind of origins of stories using these figures. Um, Tiresias is in the Odyssey, and then we come to 1922, and Tiresias is this blind prophet figure who is, um, who is uh, overseeing what all of these are different events which happen in the wasteland. Because if you don't, if you know, maybe you already know um, Tiresias, uh, in mythology is uh, a prophet, so he can, he can tell the future, but he's blind, so he can't see. And he also, in, he appears in, very, in many different uh, stories, but um, ancient stories, but he, one of the things he's famous for is having been turned into a woman and then back into a man. So uh, he, he's experienced both um, sexes. So that's another thing which is significant and is mentioned in uh, the wasteland. So uh, the if we, yeah, he if we if we go to the if we find, hang on, I will show you the text. Um, just go to the text of the wasteland. Is my screen still? Can you still see my screen? You can, yeah. Um, okay, so where is Tiresias? Let's look for him later, I think. Yeah, okay. So this is, um, this scene is, um, it's another depressing scene, sadly, but, um, I'll just read this little bit for you. I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. Um, 
so this Tiresias is overseeing a scene which then unfolds of a, a, a woman who is um, come ho comes home from work and um, making a kind of food from tins and then an, a man, a young man comes to visit her and there's a kind of sad story of them trying to be intimate and it's not really very enjoyable for either of them and this is the story that's being told but the person who's watching is Tiresias um, and later see I Tiresias old man with wrinkled dugs perceived the scene and foretold the rest I too awaited the expected guest he the young man carbuncular arrives a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare so um carbuncular the young man carbuncular carbuncular carbuncles are like boils so he has boils on his skin so this is a not a nice description of this man um and then uh the way that this scene is described um the meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavours to engage her in caresses which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter, encounter no defence, his vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes along the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. So, yeah, and this, the, the story goes on. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a sad, it's, it's quite a sad part of the, the, poem, the poem, uh, part of the many sad parts of the poem. So, yeah, I'm not uh, showing you this in, in order to say that you should all write sad poems at all. Um, I just think it's very interesting as a format, as a structure um, to, to look at. So that's Tiresias. Um, let's go back to the contemporary uh, example here with K Tempest. So I will read Tempest's poem about Tiresias, which is very different. The boy Tiresias. Watch him, kicking a tennis ball, keeping it up. The boy on the street in his sister's old jumper. Watch him, absorbed in the things that he does. Crouch down, observing the worms and the slugs. He's shaping their journeys, placing his leaves in their paths, playing with fate. God cub sucking on sherbet, riding his bike in the sunlight, filmic, perfect. But one day he'll be hunchbacked, riddled with pain, desperate for love, but too weak to enjoy it. Mumbling at strangers on trains, how strange that when we have youth, we're so keen to destroy it. We do not choose, but follow blindly. We do not own, just sometimes carry. We do not make, we undertake to be more alive each day we wake. And this is a must. And the days are all dust. And the only thing worse than losing the trust of a lover is finding the rust of their kiss. He will live longer than all of his passions. But for now, he is young still and everything's his. Because the boy will grow up makes him no less innocent. Watch him, staring at what doesn't bore him. Son of himself, all things are his moons. He can even now feel his destiny calling. He holds it to his chest, like addressing to a wound. So in this poem, the mythological figure is translated to the very normal everyday scene of a little boy playing in the street. Um, and there's ver various references to contemporary times like a tennis ball um, being on trains. So we know this is in the now, the here and now. Um, but the references to the Tiresias myth are all in there. 
Um, so, and the way that this boy is shown as though he's a kind of a god. I mean, she has this word uh, god cub, which is um, a really nice kind of neologism, god cub. Um, and the way that this boy is um, observing the worms and the slugs, shaping their journeys, placing his leaves in their paths, playing with fate. So this is the God, this is the kind of the role of the God, um, shaping the journeys of the worms and the slugs who are like the, the mortal people. Um, so I think this is a really nice example of how um, a myth can be still, a myth is still alive in contemporary times. Um, and one thing which Tempest does, uh, especially in this text, the uh, brand new ancients, which I have a picture of there, which is many different mythological figures translated to um, contemporary times set in London now. Um, and they're just people going through life, um, dramatic events happening, um, but the, the mythological thread is still there. So, um, so you get a bit of a feeling of what Tempest is like as a, as a writer, just wanted to show you, um, and as a performer, just wanted to show you, uh, mm, hang on, wanted to show you this poem from them, uh, my Shakespeare, why is that not working? Hang on. One second, I'll just find it anyway. Not that one, it's that one. Um, it's called My Shakespeare. There it goes like this. He's in every lover who ever stood alone beneath a window. In every jealous whispered word, in every ghost that will not rest. He's in every father with a favourite, every eye that stops to linger on what someone else has got and starts to widen in distress. He's in every young man that grows boastful, every worn out elder drunk for days, muttering false prophecies and squandering his lot. He's in every mix up that spirals far out of control and never seems to end even when its beginnings are forgot. And he's in every girl who ever used her wits to outsmart the status quo. He's in every vain admirer, every passionate, ambitious social climber. He's in every misheard word that ever led to tempers fraying, every pawn that moves across the board and still remains convinced that it's not playing. So he's in every star-crossed lover and every thought that ever set your teeth on edge and every breathless hero stepping closer to the ledge. His is the method in our madness as pure as the driven snow. His the hair standing on end. He saw that all that glittered was not gold. He knew we hadn't slept a wink and that our hearts were on our sleeves and that the beast with two backs had us all upon our knees as we fought fire with fire he knew that too much of a good thing could leave you up in arms the pen is mightier than the sword still his words seem to sing our names as they strike here's the milk of human kindness warm enough to break the ice here's the green-eyed monster in a pickle still discretion is the better part of valor his letters with their arms around each other's shoulders swagger to the ends of their sentences pleased with everything they've done his words are the setting for our stories he has become a poet whose poetics have embedded themselves so deep within the fabric of our language it's like he's in our mouths his words have tangled around our own and given rise to expressions so effective in expressing how we feel we can't imagine how we'd feel without them see he's less the tights and garters more the sons demanding answers from the absence of their fathers the hot darkness of your last embrace is in the laughter of the night before the tightened jaw of the morning after he is in us part and parcel of our royals and our rascals so he's more than something boring taught in classrooms in language that's hard to understand he's more than the feeling of an inadequacy you get when you sit for an exam he's in every wise woman every pitiful villain every great king every sore loser every fake tear his legacy exists in the life that lives in everything he's written. And if you listen, you'll hear him everywhere. He's my Shakespeare. So that's Tempest, K Tempest for you. Um, so I think that poem, hang on, I think that's gonna play again. We just stop that. Soaring. Sorry, there are many videos you can uh, find of uh, Tempest. We've been around for a while now. Um, and I think, 
as a performer, Tempest is amazing. So um, that poem is really nice as an example uh, of how to use someone else's voice, someone else's words in a way of your own. So almost everything in that poem is a direct quotation of a phrase made up by Shakespeare. Um, but it's a phrase which it occurs in a Shakespeare play or a poem and has been used so much, it has become a phrase we use in English just to describe something. It's no longer a quotation, it's a kind of metaphorical expression. So the poem kind of shows through the performance of these phrases, how important Shakespeare has been to the English language. Um, and the way that Tempest delivers this, you can, you can hear the, the fact that they used to, that they began as a rapper. You can really hear it in the rhythm, the rhyme and the rhythm. Um, this, I think, is a really great poem for making Shakespeare kind of showing how Shakespeare is still important and still relevant. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a, con a great example of a contemporary poet, I think, working within these kind of different voices and um, mythical voices as well. So um, what would be great then would be to uh, have a go. Let's go back to the wasteland and have a go at working with this text. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>